Hello students, today's video lecture is on movements at the joints. Now there's a couple of things that you must understand before we proceed. And so if you have not already watched the planes of movement video or review video, then make sure that you do that. Um, I do want to remind you that when we move the different parts of our body, like these pictures are indicating, we will refer to the anatomical position as the neutral position. So we're going to start in this position, move away from it, let's say by lifting the arm out to the side, and then return back to neutral. Now, those movements that we're going to be talking about, in order to keep them straight, we kind of segregate them into what plane they occur in. And so I wanted to do... Um, to label these planes really quick and just remind you what, uh, how they divide the body. So this first plane we see is dividing the body into a front or anterior and into a back or posterior. And this is called the frontal plane. That's the first plane of movement that we'll be discussing what kinds of movements can take place in the frontal plane. So the idea is when we move the body, we'll never leave this plane. You can imagine if this guy bent over at the waist, you know, and tipped forward, his entire upper half, maybe like right there, would leave this sort of plane that's in blue. We don't want that. We want movement to only occur within this plane. The second plane divides the body into a right portion and a left portion. Um, if it's right down the middle, we have equal left and right, but we can also shift this plane to the side and perhaps cut the arm at the shoulder or cut the leg at the hip joint, etc. So this is called a sagittal plane and it can be further subdivided into a mid-sagittal if it's in the middle or a parasagittal on the side, but I'll review that with you later. Finally, the last plane is divides the body into a superior or upper section and an inferior or lower section, and this is called a transverse plane. Keep in mind with the transverse plane, it does not have to be through the midsection. It could be through the neck. It could be through the leg. It could be wherever the joint is that we're talking about. Okay, so the first plane that we're going to concentrate on is the frontal plane. So everything below this line are movements that can occur in a frontal plane. So I have that again right here, frontal plane. And then it might help you to understand if we view it from above. Keep in mind that this technically could move backwards or forwards, but we're dividing the body into a front piece and a back piece. And as we move our parts, we never want to move out of this plane. Okay, so you see the first motion right here. This particular individual is moving the arm away from the body and then closer to the body. That movement right there is taking place in this plane. So imagine if this person lifted their arm out to the side, they would stay within that plane. And as they brought it back closer to the body, they are never going to leave this plane. If, for example, let me go to another page and I'll show you. This motion right here, lifting the arm to the front, almost like lifting your whole arm out to the front. If this person lifted their entire arm out of the to the front of their body, they would be leaving the frontal plane. It's almost like he's locked in this pane of glass and he can only move within this pane. Okay, so these two pictures are similar and they show similar movements. Just one is the arm and one is the leg. The main point is if you're moving a limb away from the midline, that movement is called abduction. Okay, so I've written here, abduction is movement of a limb away from the body's midline. And so that is going to be represented by this action here, lifting the arm out to the side is abduction, and lifting the leg out to the side is abduction. Now, if we have an action that lifts the leg out to the side, we better have a word for when you bring it closer. And we do. Same with the arm. The opposite of abduction, we need to be very careful with this because the spelling is similar. 
adduction, movement of the limb closer to the body's midline. So the opposite in each picture, as that person brings their arm closer to their body, is adduction. And then same for the leg, as the leg, after you've lifted it out to the side and you move it closer to the middle, it's going to be adduction again. Okay, and again, when we refer to the midline, we're talking the midline here. So think about it this way. If you are abducted, you are taken away. And in both of these cases, we're moving the limb away from the midline. If you move the limb closer to the body, you add it back on, adduction. So abduct is away and add is bringing it back closer. A quick visual, adduction, abduction, adduction, and then in the leg, abduction and adduction. That's abduction, adduction. Okay, there's two other movements that are not the same as these that occur in the frontal plane as well. And this first one kind of looks maybe similar Here's the midline again, except this time we're not moving the limb. The movement's taking place at the vertebral column. So you can do this with either your head and just tilt your head to either side, the left or the right, or you can do it with your entire torso, which is what this person is showing. Either way, these movements are called lateral flexion. And this only applies to the vertebral column. Okay, and just remember that the vertebral column will include movement of just the head, which is happening at the neck, or of the whole torso, like shown here. So that's called lateral flexion. And again, you can imagine that this person would be able to bend to his left or his right and still maintain staying within this pane of glass, or a plane as we call it. Okay, lateral flexion at the neck, tipping the head back and forth, and then also lateral flexion of the vertebral column, tipping the whole torso to the left or right. So we're moving it away from the midline. All right, the last one you can see is the foot. And this word is specific to the foot. So we can either, um, we're gonna modify the position of the sole. Just keep in mind, you have to kind of watch where the big toe is. And this is the big toe right here. So we have two terms. If you move the sole closer to the midline, remember the midline would be here. If you move the sole closer to the midline, that term is called inversion. Inversion, moving the soles inward towards the midline. If you move the sole of the foot or the bottom of the foot away from the midline, it is known as eversion. So that's the one that's kind of in this bluish color here. All right, so this is a right foot and here's the big toe. So got to keep track of that toe. All right, let me add my definition. So the options we have for movement in the frontal plane are abduction and adduction. We use those only for limbs. Lateral flexion, which is the same concept, but it's only for your vertebral column, your torso or your head. And then if you move your ankle, if you have ankle movement, it's called inversion if the sole of the foot goes inward. This would be like when you roll your ankle or eversion when the sole of the foot goes outward, away from the body's midline. Here's inversion and eversion in a different, a little bit different angle. Inversion, soles in, eversion, soles lateral. So that takes care of the frontal plane. Let's move on to the movements occurring in a sagittal plane. And I put this reminder right here so you could see what the sagittal plane is. And then again, a view from above. Remember, the sagittal plane divides the body into a right, a right side, and a left side. And you can shift this back and forth. If it's in the middle, we call it a mid-sagittal. Okay, so if you see any head movement or vertebral column movement, you want to imagine the plane is there. If you see arm movement like over here or leg movement, you want to imagine that it's a parasagittal plane. So shift that plane in your mind all the way over to the arm or have it go right through the leg. And you can see that we can only like lift the leg forward and backwards if we want to stay in the plane. The second we try to do abduction, moving away from the midline like we saw on the last page, 
that is leaving the sagittal plane. So that's a no-no. We can't call it abduction. All right, so it turns out every single picture on this page is either flexion or extension. Um, when we get to the bottom, the ankle has a specific version of that, specific words, but it's still considered a flexion and extension. So let's write down some definitions for the words flexion and extension. Okay, so the definition for flexion, this is going to sound really wordy, but is decreasing the anterior angle between two bones in the sagittal plane. What? Let's look at the elbow, for example. Imagine our neutral position and we have a humerus in the upper arm and a radius and ulna in the lower arm and we're going to take that angle when we're in anatomical position which would be this part of the drawing right here this would be 180 degrees right roughly it's a straight line and we're going to decrease that 180 to roughly 90 so we went from 180 to 90 that's decreasing in short really what we're doing is we're bending it forward okay flexion is like saying bend it forward so you look this movement is flexion when you bend your elbow it's flexion at the elbow same as if you bend your wrist move it forward we're bending it forward so flexion it gets a little strange at the shoulder but if you lift your whole arm to the front it stays in the sagittal plane. Imagine the sagittal plane over by the shoulder. It's staying in that plane and lifting it to the front is flexion at the shoulder. The same for lifting the leg to the front. That's called flexion at the hip. I'm going to skip this one for just a second. Bending forward of the vertebral column, flexion. Bending the neck forward, anything pretty much that you can bend forward. And I'm going to come back to this one. Now, you might notice in the definition, I put this little star right here. And I did that because decreasing the anterior or front angle between two bones, we cannot do that for the knee. So the knee works backwards because that's how it works. So if we bend the knee, that's flexion, bending the knee. So all of those are flexion. Now, what's the opposite of flexion? And the answer is extension. So extension will have a similar definition, except instead of saying decreasing the anterior angle, we'll say increasing. Okay, so extension is just the opposite. Instead of bending, we're straightening. And generally extension is when you move something towards the back of the body. So after we've bent the elbow, when we straighten our elbow, that's extension. After we've bent the wrist, when we straighten it back to neutral, that is extension. Extension at the wrist. If flexion is lifting up, extension is putting back to neutral. You can even with your shoulder, especially if your arm went backwards more like this, or some people are super flexible back here, that would be called hyperextension. So not all hyperextensions are bad. Um, so this way is flexion this way is extension or technically hyperextension here. Okay, to the knee, flexion is bending, extension is straightening. That one works a little differently. Flexion bending forward, extension straightening or bending backwards. Um, Bending the neck forward is flexion, straightening it is extension. And of course you can hyperextend by going back past the neutral or anatomical position. And that leaves me with this picture right here. Um, lifting the toes up is actually a flexion because it's taking the anterior angle right here and making it smaller. However, we have special words for the ankle. Flexion at the ankle is called dorsiflexion. So that's going to be this kind of orangish arrow right here. We have special words for the ankle. I cannot tell you why, but we do. Dorsiflexion. It's only for the ankle. That only works for the ankle. Nowhere else. Extension at the ankle. Here's where it gets a little tricky. Extension at the ankle is called plantar flexion. 
don't ask me why they decided to call a extension plantar flexion. Plantar is the bottom of the foot. So somebody wasn't thinking that one through all the way. Just think if you point your toe down, you plant it on the ground. Plantar flexion is when you point the toe. Okay, so all the movements on this page occur in the sagittal plane. Again, keep in mind, you have to move that sagittal plane to the left or to the right to intersect the joint that's being moved. But really, flexion is like bending and extension is like straightening in most cases. Um, and you can extend past that neutral position. The only one that's a little funky is the knee because it bends backwards. Okay, and then remember we have these two special words for just ankle flexion and ankle extension, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Okay, here is flexion at the shoulder. There's flexion, extension, and even hyperextension all at the shoulder. Now we can move down to the leg, flexion, extension back to neutral, and hyperextension if you extend beyond that. We can do that at the elbow, flexion and extension, no hyper there. <laughs> and the wrist, flexion, extension, and hyperextension. With the neck, flexion, extension, flexion and extension. And the torso, whoa, flexion, extension, there you go. And the knee flexion, extension. See how we bend it backwards for the knee? And then the ankle, dorsi and plantar flexions. Dorsi's up and plantar's down. Okay, last but not least are movements that occur in the transverse plane. And remember, a transverse plane divides the body into a superior and inferior portion. And we can move the transverse plane anywhere on the body. So depending on um, what part we're moving, I want you to think about pushing that transverse plane. Like this one shows movement at the neck and then movement at the torso. Imagine the transverse plane intersect intersecting the neck or the torso. When we get down here to where the shoulder movement is occurring, you want to think about that transverse plane intersecting the shoulder. Okay. All right, most of these, all of these are spins or twists. So like the neck twist, the torso twist, we're like twisting the arm, twisting the leg. And in this lower one, we're twisting just the lower arm. So this is all a twist, what's called a rotation. And a rotation twists one bone in relation to another. So all these things on this page are a variation of rotation. Um, so if we look at this first picture, um, we have two, well, two things happening, but they, we call them the same. If you turn your head to the side, or if you turn your body to the side, all we do is just call it um, right or left rotation, depending on which side you're looking to. So this guy has turned his head to the left, and he's turned his body to his left. So both of these would be called left rotation. It's when you turn your entire body or your head to the left or right. So I'm going to write the definition down here as left, right, rotation. And that will apply to the torso or the head. Okay, so we only use this one for vertebral column and he happens to be turning to the left. So that's why I'm putting left rotation here. Now, when we get down to the limbs, we have to use a different terminology because we have a left limb and a right limb. When we turn the entire limb, either inward towards the midline or outwards away from the midline, we call it medial and lateral rotation. So if the entire limb is twisting, I know the arm is bent, which makes it a little strange, but the movement is happening here at the shoulder where the humerus is actually twisting in place. So I'm making a note that the movement is going to occur at the ball and socket joint. The whole humerus itself is actually twisting inside the ball and socket. So if we look at each picture, this movement is towards the midline. So this one is medial rotation. And if we look on this picture, it's going the other way. The whole upper arm is twisting away from the midline. So that's going to be lateral rotation. 
the same exact words are used for the leg. So we can see that this whole leg at the hip joint is twisting. So the movement is occurring right here at this ball and socket. And the whole leg turns as a unit. So this side would be lateral rotation because it's turning away from the midline. And this one would be medial rotation because it's turning towards the midline. And again, I think you know where the midline is, but just in case, the midline is straight down the middle. Okay, last but not least is the final type of rotation where only the lower arm is rotating. So we have an interesting situation where we can twist at the ball and socket, but we also have an, the option to twist at the radius just because of its structure. Okay, so movement is happening here. In this case, only the lower arm moves in this situation. Let's start here. When you go from palm posterior to palm anterior, when you flip your palm over so the palm is showing, that's known as supination. And so I'll put that here. If you were to go from the palm forward to the palm backwards, like flip this direction, that's actually called pronation. So if you start with your palm forward and flip it over so the palm is back, that's pronation. Flip it back so the palm shows again, that's supination. And it's only the forearm that's rotating, not the whole limb. If it's an entire limb, we use either medial or lateral rotation. And if it's not a limb at all, then we use left and right rotation. Um, it's sort of a little tricky to figure out how this is in the transverse plane, but if you take a look at this guy's arm, when he moves back and forth from medial to lateral rotation, he would be staying within this transverse plane here. Okay, there's me lateral and medial rotation at the shoulder, medial towards the midline. You can see the whole arm is twisting, lateral rotation. And then if we look at the leg, the entire leg does the same, medial and lateral rotation, medial towards the middle. I'll zoom out so you can see the whole leg. Lateral rotation, medial rotation. Um, if we move into the head neck area, that's right and left rotation. Just turning and looking to the right and left, same with the body, right, left rotation. Then we have our fancy special one at the forearm only. So notice how the radius and ulna interact and the radius spins in place. This is supination here with the palm forward, pronation with the back. There you have it, movements at the joints.